you sent me in a generic email out of your CRM that you plug my name in and you push the button and you don't care about me, you don't care about what I do, you don't care about anything, you're just a moron. And by the way, somebody in your organization taught you to do that and they're a moron too. One, two, three, four. Hey Warners, welcome to Women Your Mother Warned You About. The podcast that makes everything sexy again. I'm Rachel Pitts, realtor, mortgage loan officer, mom, and uh, apparently I'm not the one that's in love with Jeb and <laughs> Blunt, but Jean is. <laughs> that's why she's giggling and so I'm much. Jean- We're so giddy <laughs> from speaking with him. And I'm Gina Trebeco, founder and sales trainer at Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv with a big business crush on Jeb Blunt. Don't tell Gittimer or in arena. <laughs> you guys, this is the, it's, uh, it really is amazing to yeah. have had such a wonderful and, and in my humble opinion, high profile guest on the show today. And what's really interesting is what he talks about, uh, about how to actually get him, get catch his interest and get him booked. He, he discusses that in this episode. So if you're interested, you know, take a listen. Well, they're here, so why go now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Stick Keep around, listening, baby. Stick around. A uh, super fun show today with Jeb Blunt. Um, as I say on the show to him straight to his face, I always like, I didn't even get to ask him about, am I flux? I can't even say the word that I feel right Twitter now. Twitter pated. Twitter pated. I didn't even get a chance to ask him, um, like, there are other questions like, you know, how do you define a woman? Your mother warned you about what's sexy. We didn't even get there. Anyway, it we didn't need to. Yeah, there's a lot of wonderful content from Jeb. Um, and Gina, why didn't, would you like me to tell everybody about Jeb so you can just recover? <laughs> Jeb Blood is why, the author. Why of- don't you tell everybody about Jeb? Because I'm so Twitter page. She's going to sit there and fan herself. Jeb is the author of 10, count them, 10, actually about to be 12, 10 books including Fanatical Prospecting, Objections, Sales, EQ, and People by You. He is among the world's most respected speakers, trainers, and thought leaders on sales, leadership, and customer experience. As a sales acceleration specialist, he helps sales organizations reach peak performance fast by optimizing talent, leveraging training to cultivate a high performance culture, developing leadership and coaching skills, and applying more effective organizational design. Jeb spends more than... He spends... uh, Oh, oh, okay. (laughs) I was trying to give you a chance, you know. No, oh, no, 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 go. No, continue, please. Uh, continue <laughs> Tell us fanning more about your, Jeb. Continue fanning yourself there, love. Jeb spends more than 250 days on the road each year delivering keynote speeches and training programs to high-profile teams and leaders across the globe. Through his global training organization called Sales Gravy, Jeb advises a who's who of the world's most well-known organizations and their executives on the impact of emotional intelligence and intrapersonal skills on customer-facing activities. He delivers training to thousands of participants in both public and private forums, which is one reason why we are just thrilled that we got got his time today. As a business leader, Jeb has more than 25 years of experience with Fortune 500 companies, small and mid-sized business, um, and startups. His flagship website, salesgravy.com, is the most visited sales-specific website on the planet. The planet. Holy moly. Now I feel very humble that he gave us some time. And and he genuinely seemed interested in talking to us. He wasn't just like giving us lip service. (laughs) I know. He likes. He didn't us. like click because he could easily have clicked like leave meeting when Gina like jumped on him and I said, "I'm in love with you in a sales sense." <laughs> no, he's fabulous and and super gracious and like most people that we we put on a pedestal of like this guy is like the it guy in sales. He's real down to earth and just you know, it just is simply easy to talk to and great guy. And a smart guy. I, I have been reading his books and following him for years. Uh, I've used a lot of his content. I said that to get him once. I'm like, he's like, ah, did you, did you pay royalties on it? I'm like, I gave you credit 
in the presentation. Like you, you want to you want to take from the from the best experts and carry their message on. And I'm a huge fan of Sales EQ because I don't know what I love doing more: training and emotional intelligence or sales training. And I love those two worlds. And that book, Sales EQ, really meshes it up together of how important it is emotionally because selling is emotional and buying is emotional. And he really hits on that today about how important it is to be able to manage your own emotions so that you can help lead people through their buying process. And it starts first with you. And we all know a lot of us salespeople are very emotional. (laughs) I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Before we jump into our interview with Jeb, (laughs) we have a few things to share with you. We've got Warner World, which is our private Facebook group that you can join at warner-world.com. That's warner-world.com. You can check it out. It just means that you get a little more private time with Gina and I if you look into that sort of thing. Private time. Private dancer. Private time. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else going on that's exciting that... Well, you know what's really exciting exciting for me is that I have made that shift into the mortgage industry and and I was listening to all the things that Jeb was saying about, you know, uh, the micro commitments and and again, like we hear all the time creating these relationships. And I'm I'm brand new in the mortgage industry. I'm old school like long time in the real estate industry, so I know out of the gate the ledge that I'm going to hit that he discusses in this this episode is that they already have, if I'm calling a realtor, that they already have a, a, a lender that they're working with. So I just assume that they're going to say that. And I put it right out there. I'm like, I'm sure you already have a lender that you work with already because you've been at this so long and you're so successful. And then it just is, it's a different approach rather than, hey, I am a mortgage officer. Can you use me? <laughs> like it's so, it was really interesting. All the things that he says can be applied to every single sales call. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, it doesn't matter of the industry. And he talks about that in his book, Objections, too. And he touches a little bit on this episode about we're all, you know, we all have the same brain. We just all choose a different way to communicate. So that's a really important thing to keep in mind. And every industry is different, but really a lot of this comes down to the same basic steps that you should be taking when dealing with other humans. So let's get on with this episode with Jeb, um, who was so gracious to join us while he's on vacation to record this episode of Women Your Mother Warned You About. Hey, Jeb. Hey, how y'all doing? We're good. I'm going to just like right off the bat say to you that I hope this doesn't bother you, but hopefully you've been warned because we are the women your mother warned you about. I have a major business crush on you and I just need to get it out of my system. (laughs) Tina, you're supposed to take him to dinner before you attack him. I know. (laughs) I know, but I am so super excited that you are on this podcast with us, and we know how busy you are, so we're extremely grateful that you have time to come on with us, uh, women that your mother warned you about, while you're on vacation, so thank you. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you very much, and I'm flattered that you have a business crush on me, (laughs) and I'll uh, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep it in check. Okay, and just between... The three of us do not tell Anthony and Arena that or Jeffrey Gittimer, because I think I've told them the same things. <gasps> You're a tease. I know. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm younger and way better looking than Gittimer. So, and, 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 and neither Gittimer nor, nor in Arena have hair. So I was about to say more I'm, hair. I'm, uh, you're, you're killing it on the hair department. You are. Def- yeah. You're definitely crushing it on the, on the hair part. <laughs> Anthony, he says, he says, you know, the first time I ever saw you, I didn't like you because I didn't like your hair. <laughs> Hater. Well, he's really proud of writing the forward to uh, to Sales EQ because we yes, brought we brought it up um, when he was on our show because it's that's one of my of your books. That's one of my favorite of all time books. Like that's a book that I constantly go back to because we do a lot with train sales, but we do a lot with. EQ training, and that's one of my favorite, favorite books. And we talked about it, and he's like, the foreword's amazing in that book. 
<laughs> That's true. That's true. I'll give him that. He did write a very nice forward to that. Anthony's a good friend for that. <laughs> and I forgot that he had written it. I'm like, oh, did you write that? So he's very <laughs> proud. Oh, we hear the boats. That's so cool. I love it. So Jeb's on vacation. Rachel and I are here with Jeb, having him on our show. Super excited. You have been warned about us. You know a little bit about us, right, Jeb? Uh, a little bit. I have been okay. warned. You have been warned. Okay, good. So, you know, off off the, the top, like th- something that comes to my mind is, and I asked Anthony this same question, is, you know, just getting you on this podcast to us feels like a major sales win, right? Because you are well-known, you are busy, you're an expert in what you do, you're a celebrity in your own kind in your industry, and to get you on our show feels like a major win. And I'm curious because it is sales to to get guests on our show. What was the tipping point that we were able to like have you here today? You probably were able to connect with somebody on my team that could get you on my calendar. Yeah, because it, it, it's, it's not a major win because it was a great sales thing. It's a major win because I'm on the road. Last year, I did 317 nights on the road. This year, I'm tracking 300. The year before that, I did 307. So the hardest part is, just getting me nailed down on a calendar. And generally, like the last big role of, of podcast I did was in December when I was off the road for two weeks. I did I was doing five podcasts a day. And then this two weeks, I'm off the road. And uh, I wasn't planning on being up here. I was planning on being in my studio. But I've got a book that needs to be done. And I need to take some time off. So I'm, I'm doing this up here. So for me, you know, it, I think this is true for a lot of executives. I'm the CEO of a you know, a mid-sized training company, when you have 20 trainers on the street and you're on the street and you're selling and you've got all these things going on and you're trying to run a business, it's really, really hard to get an, an executive's time nailed down. So the key is, is the relationship that you built with somebody on my team who got this whole thing figured out. And I'm assuming it's Lisa because she figures those things out. And this morning at seven o'clock, she starts tweeting me or tweet or ch- chatting with me. And every, you know, every 30 minutes, she's reminding me that I have to be on this podcast. So she makes sure that I show up and get things done. But I think, I think that, that it's the, it's, it's not, uh, do I, do I not want to do podcasts or I not want to talk to people? It's just the ability to maneuver inside of my calendar. I did one yesterday and, you know, the guy, the guy goes, he says, he goes, okay, he says, I can't believe I finally got this done. I'm like, why? He goes, he goes, because I've been on your calendar for six months because he goes, that's how far out they were booking me in order to pull this in. Now, if someone was to call me today, for example, and say, I want to be on the podcast and I have space on my calendar. And then there's, you know, there's always an option of dropping that in. But I'm doing like today I'm doing, I think, four podcasts a day where we've got them lined up to, you know, to to, to have conversations with people. But so much of it is the ability to be flexible and work with the, with the calendar. Um, and because I I think most people who are, you know, doing what you guys do have a pretty compelling message. You have a really good reason for being there. There's a real, there's a a lot of reasons for me to spend time with you. Um, the, you know, the, the business crush notwithstanding, but the, but the key is you've got to figure out how to get into my system past all the gatekeepers so that, so that you can, you can schedule. Because if, you know, when people come to me, the the initial thing I say is yes, you got to go talk to these people. And then, and then I, I I move on so I can keep running the business. Well, I think that's important because that that is what you did. You said yes and you passed it on. And so at the end of the day, you're the final decision maker. But there's something that has to compel you to. I'm sure you get other pitches for things. You're like, oh hell no, I don't want to do that. Oh, I get a lot of pitches for stuff, and uh, and typically there are pitches for people trying to sell me things. And, you know, for me, it's like, I don't think you read the book, right? So you just, I got one this morning. It was a, a generic email that a sales development rep sent me um, that had my name, you know, computer generated all in, in inside the email. And I just deleted it. And I, you know, I looked at it as like the, the message itself was compelling. It was actually even interesting, but screw you. That's not how you're going to get me. Pick up the phone and work at it. Like call me up. And, and I get my phone out. I mean, my phone is on, is on the internet. I mean, you can find it. It's there. My phone never rings. People don't call. So people are happy to hide behind an email and send me an email, but I can guarantee it. Podcasts are different. Like people coming in who are, you know, you're, it, I'm grateful to be on your show more than you're grateful for me to be on your, your show. I mean, I, it's, it's for me to be here is an honor. And, and, you know, and I, it's, cause it's, it's a good thing. 
So I, that's a different type of, of communication. But when you're trying to sell me something, like, you know, you're and, you, and you're going to email it in or text it in or chat it in or direct message it in. Give me a break. I promise you, you're not going to get my attention. And that's true for most executives. I've worked with CEOs all over the world. So my, you know, my firm, we're in, in some of the biggest companies, um, but we're in mid-sized companies. You talk to every C-level executive and they will all tell you the same thing. You are not going to get a meeting with me via email. Pick up the phone and call me. But that means that if you're trying to level executive, you better, better by God, be prepared to work your butt off because you've got to prove that you're worthy. And a great example of that is my son who was doing an intern this summer with a company called Paycom, a uh, you know, big uh, you know, HR digital transformation company, love the company there. You know, they've given him this great opportunity. He's crushing it, setting tons of appointments, you know, getting indoors, getting in C-level. He's 21 years old. He called the CEO three weeks ago and the CEO said, I'm not interested. I will never be interested. I'm never going to buy from you. And oh, by the way, I'm busy for the next year. So don't effing call me back again. He said, it hurt. He said, but then I was listening to you or some Mike Weinberg or somebody. And he goes, you know, he said, this guy showed back up on the list again. I decided to call him back. But this time I changed my message. He said, so I called him back, changed my message. He told me to go pound sand. He said, but then game on. He said, so another week went by. I called him back again, got him back on the telephone. And the guy goes, didn't you call me three times? And he goes, yeah, I did. He, he said, but you've got to listen to me. I've got this, 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 and this. And all I need is 20 minutes. And the guy goes, all right, come on in. I'll give you the time. This is, you know, this is a, a company that's got almost 500 employees, which is a pretty big deal, right? And, you know, and he calls me up and he goes, you're not going to believe what happened. And he goes, he goes exactly what you said. He says, you know, one day they tell you that they hate you. And then the next day they set an appointment with you. And I said, yeah, you know, you've got to, you've got to, you've got to earn that right. And okay, so go places like New York City. I've got a client up there. We go cold calling on the streets of New York City, like cold call businesses, walking through the front door, knocking on the door. You spend a day, you're going to get told no 60 different languages. I mean, you're going to get thrown out. You're going to get cussed out. You're going to get everything. But the, but the thing about that, that business is if you show up five times and you take abuse five times in a row, the sixth time they'll say, all right, tell me what you got or come back next week and I'll talk to you because they want you to earn it. They want to see that you've got the chops in there. So I think that so many salespeople they give up the first time or they don't recognize the power of that, or they're so afraid that they're going to get an objection or get rejection. And when you're prospecting, objections have a tendency to move into rejection. They call once, they get told no, they never call back again. Or they're like that schmuck this morning who sent me that stupid email who has a decent product that I probably would be interested in learning about. But instead of picking up the phone and calling me, or, you know, making an attempt of you call me and leave me a voice message and then see me an email, you sent me in a generic email out of your CRM that you plug my name in and you push the button and you don't care about me. You don't care about what I do. You don't care about anything. You're just a moron. And by the way, somebody in your organization taught you to do that. And they're a moron too. Don't get Gina started on that line. Don't, don't even start Gina on it. Cause she, that's a huge, uh, those kind of uh, generic messages she hates. Well, I'm writing the book called overcoming trolls. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I and the I think the my uh, let me just say this week on a regional sales call that I was on with my company, they're actually I just joined this company, mortgage company U.S. Mortgage, and we had a regional sales call. They've been reading through fanatical prospecting, which I've read of course before. So we were on a certain chapter and we were going through the whole thing, um, chapter eight on time and. Uh, at the end of it, I texted my regional manager. I said, hey, by the way, we're interviewing Jeb this week. It's so cool. And he's like, how did you do what? He's like, how did you get that set up? And I said, persistence, just persistence. Because I know that, you know, Gina has been with reaching out and reaching out and reaching out. And um, that's just the way you get it done. And agree, like in real estate, people will be like, I'm not ready to buy. I'm never buying. Leave me alone. It's like, okay, put them on the list. Call them in six weeks. Call them again. <laughs> well, it's interesting because I've, I've, um, I've reached out to, cause I'm on your mailing list. So I, I get the emails, I read them. And then I got the one about, a, the, about objections, which I am in the middle of. And I like, love it. I had to go back and like re-listen to, before I could move on because there were like some great things in there. And I want to talk about that book. But I had also called Anthony. I said, Hey, can you do anything to get us in with Jeb? And he's like, you know, I'll try, but he's busy. And I'm like, could you just put in a word for us ladies? So I got the email on objections 
and the, and I that I responded to that, and I'm like, hey, want to come on the show and talk about your book? And that's when I got the response, whether it was you or Lisa. I was like, you know, I think a big part of it is understanding what's in it for that other person, right? Yeah, like, what's but, the value hey, for was, you? So, so this this sounds like this sounds really crazy, but my I Anthony will tell you I've got the biggest list in sales. I'm I've, I'm we've got 1.2 million people on our list. So, but. I respond, if people write me back, if I send out a newsletter, you get my newsletter, you write me back, the response is always me, 100% me. I run all my social media. If you hit me on social media, it's always me. Yeah. And that takes, I mean, that is why I'm busy. It takes a lot of work. Uh, but yeah, you, you know, when you write me back and say stuff like that, you did offer me some value. The value is you want to talk about your book. Okay, I'm an author. No, I don't like to talk about my book. I mean, then you're a moron <laughs> author. So, you know, so I think that I think that it is persistence and it's not giving up. And um, in, uh, in objections, I tell a story about, I, I, there was a company called Fujifilm that I was pursuing. This is, this is back in the days when I was, you know, humping it on the street, carrying a briefcase. Uh, and it was a big, 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 big deal. And, uh, and I, I had a buying window that was open and I had to get in. If the buying window closed, they would sign a contract with my competitor and it would lock me out for another five years. So the buyer just wouldn't respond. I couldn't get any response. I've been trying for six months and we, we hit the 90 day window where I, something had to happen or I was going to lose it. So I called him every day for 52 days in a row, every day. I called him every day and left him voicemail message every morning. It was exactly the same voicemail message. It was like Groundhog Day. I left the same voicemail message with the same tone as if I'd never left it before. And I, and I use this strategy all the time with accounts. And I don't use it with everybody. I certainly wouldn't wouldn't call someone 52 days in a row that doesn't know me and there's no particular reason for them to, to deal with me. That's a qualifying call. But in a situation where I know a buying window and I know someone's going to make a decision, I'm going to call and call and call. So 52 days in a row, I called. On day 52, dude calls me back and says, are you ever going to quit calling me? And I said, not until you meet with me. And he says, all right, come on in. So I, I walk through the door and I, I admit 52 days is extreme. Usually it only takes me about 10 days to get someone to call me back, but I do, I do this all the time, still do it. So I go in, when I get there, the, the sales manager for, for, for Fuji is there and is trying to hire me because the guy told him that I called him 52 days in a row and the sales manager says, I want people like you on my team. And, you know, and I, I see that with other salespeople who are super persistent when they show up and they're talking to C-level people, they're trying to hire them. Because the, because the people in the companies, as much as, they, as they, they push salespeople off because they don't want to talk to you at the time, they have deep respect for people who are persistent. And look, you have to be professional and you have to be polite and you have to be kind and you have to be a human. You have to do all those things. But people love people who are persistent. They may not like you in the moment like because you're, you're, you keep calling them, but they respect you and they will give you time. And you have to earn that time in this world. And you should never, ever forget about prospecting. Prospecting is asking for time. Sales is asking for commitment. And the hardest ask in sales is for time because nobody has any time. Amen. That's a great quote and so true. I know. I was, I, was, I was stuck on the quote. I couldn't yeah, even speak. Because you can't get to the sale. And I think that's one thing, like going back to the email that you received, Jeb, that when people are sending those those icky, pitchy emails trying to sell you something, they're forgetting about the prospecting end of things, which equals developing a relationship. And and sometimes that takes time. You know, you got to keep keep p plugging away at trying to get the time, and then you can see if they're interested in what you have to sell. And people just jump right, especially in social media. They just utilize it and think it's going to work. Oh, it's terrible. Don't start. Don't start. <laughs> <laughs> don't start me well, it, you know a lot of it is about you know it's about um the the process of building familiarity that's why a phone call works first and a voicemail yeah. if i see your name on a voicemail so you show up um some of it's about getting the right message so in fanatical prospecting for instance we teach a framework a four-step framework for for sending effective prospecting messages it absolutely works and, and that begins with the first sentence in the email relating to the person that you're dealing with. So if you're calling, you're trying to prospect into, say, for example, a CFO, you know, by saying something like, you know, it's CFOs have a really challenging job these days, balancing, managing the expenses and growing businesses. I mean, I mean all you have to do is step into their shoes. And every once in a while, I'll get an email like that. I'll get an email from someone that'll say, that'll say something about my business 
that that they they they're able to relate to what I go through as a CEO of a fast growing organization. As Anthony said, I'm really 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 busy because I'm I'm in the business and I'm and I'm building the business. And and sometimes I'll respond, but it would be one out of a thousand emails that gets me because. But that's the person who took the time to do that. But you got to imagine if you want to sit down and write one personalized email for one CEO, you're going to have to spend about an hour on it to get it right to get the messaging right, versus. This guy who simply had an email template and had my name off some list, someplace. I don't know where he got it, but he got it, you know, Zoom info, wherever, and just plugged my name in. And and even worse, didn't just get my first name, last name. It said, hi, Jeb Blunt. That's when you know somebody's like really messed up there. And they didn't even, like, they didn't even try. So you're not going to get anything from that. And, you know, sometimes people will call me and I buy things from salespeople all the time. People will call me, they sell stuff. You get me on the telephone. I'm a sucker. You're probably going to buy. I'm probably going to buy from you. Um, so, but if you can get me on the phone and, you know, some of the, some of the biggest products, our software products that we've run that we, we serve our clients with, um, one of the biggest ones came from an SDR who sent me an email. Um, she had left me a message, but I, I, I didn't really recognize it, but I, but later on I found her again, but she sent me an email and the first, the, like the subject line was like, I love fanatical prospecting. It's changed my life. And the second email was, uh, you know, I know you're trying to grow your business and you're really you know, passionate about what you do. And we have a way for you to connect better with your with your clients and deliver better training to them. Uh, and I, she took, took a couple of screenshots from our current LMS and showed to me I was like, this is a person who's their research, who really cared about this. And I immediately I, I saw the email and this is like maybe three emails I've ever bought from. So the email called her up and I surprised her. She didn't she wasn't prepared for it. Like she, I called her up and I was like, OK, show me what you got. And she was like, ub, ub, ub. <laughs> but, oh, but she won. And I told her why she won. I said, you got me because what you did, like what you did something that was specific to me. You stepped into my shoes. You related to my situation. And you showed me that you had my best interest at heart. And that's why I responded to you. And but especially you might have had that 20 times that I've been in the room. If I was in Asia, you might have had to hit me four or five times. Yeah. If I wouldn't have done that. I wouldn't have called you right back. But Fortunately, I was in Philadelphia, I think, when she sent me the email. I was sitting in a hotel room, I, and I remember it because it was such an impactful prospecting touch that I responded. And, and she's probably selling something that's that's a more relationship-based selling approach that it's a longer sales cycle. It's a higher product, a higher price point. She can't make that happen overnight. She has to have those touch points with you to, to win you over it. Um, ironically, this morning... I got one of those emails and it started out as dear Kathy. <laughs> that was step. Who's that was Kathy? step. Kathy, dear Kathy. <laughs> and the email came to my name, Gina at pivot results. <laughs> dear Kathy, thank you for opening up to me. I'm like, who is this? <laughs> you know, we, we, we met at either. She broke it. We met at either an event through social media or something else, like these three things. And um, I really want to help you prosper. She's a virtual CFO. I help businesses, blah, blah. It just went on and on and on. And then it was like a PS, my my secret sauce is. And I was like, is she for real? I'm like, oh, you know what? Bless her heart. And I, I, I responded that way. And I'm like getting ready this morning for our interview with you. And I'm like, no, no, no. She's about to get coached. And I said, I... I responded back and I broke down her email for her. I said, hope you don't mind. I want to give you a little coaching on this. <laughs> Step one, my name's not Jean, it's Kathy. <laughs> Step two, don't know where you got my email address. I don't know. You didn't meet you at any of these things. Step three, like I literally broke it down and um, she replied back. I will me make sure to never approach you for business. <sighs> and I... <laughs> <laughs> Hey, the fact like, that she got a response is like a big one right there. Like I was like, oh my gosh, she's going to get coached again. I'm like, okay, first of all, you've already approached me. Second of all, maybe be a little grateful for the coaching I'm giving you. I'm like, because you're selling a product that honestly you have the opportunity to kill it because it's so hard for entrepreneurs to find really good account accounting, financial bookkeeper type people. And you could be killing it right now. But but what I'm getting a sense of is you're so unorganized that whoever's running your automation did a sloppy job and that's on you. 
And so I would never trust you with my finances. And her response was, and it's not right to give people coaching without asking their permission. And I said, nor is it right to put me on your email list without permission. She's like, do not ever contact me again. <gasps> Simmer down, <laughs> Kathy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my good gracious but i really wow. want to help her now because i'm like oh she's so flawed and she could kill it if she would get out of her fixed mindset wonder what her reason for being so uh argumentative is i i remember remember i had one like that at one point too where i was i remember having a, a sort of an argumentative exchange with somebody who was selling me something off the bat and i tried to even say hey I think really it's actually a win that I responded with some, you know, what I was thinking was constructive criticism and, and feedback, but now you're in an argument with me. So then I definitely don't want to do business. Like instead of going, okay, at least I got a response. Like that's a win. Yeah. It's uh, I, I gave up on I, when I get these stupid things and I get them on the worst ones are on LinkedIn where I get somebody who just invades my direct mailbox with some BS. And I, I, I want so badly to go, you're an idiot. Let me explain why you're an idiot. But I just, I've just gone to, I just click delete because I, I find the same thing you find. It doesn't, it's not doing them any good, doing me any good. And, and the real problem is not the person, it's their leader. Now this person who's an entrepreneur, the real problem that she has is that this is a person who is probably a CFO someplace, decided she was going to start her own business being a CFO, but she hasn't read fanatical prospecting. So she's going to fail. I mean, because that, that whole exchange right. would have been that because if you think about it, if, you, if you'd done the right, you would have said, yes, thank you so much for your. And I'm so sorry I called you, Kathy, Gina. Hey, could would that be OK if I could go on the telephone with you and you could give me a little bit more coaching? Exactly. Bingo. She would have had such an opportunity to get to know me, create a relationship with me and maybe get some business. Yeah, because yep. how many other people like you, Jeb and me <laughs> are just clicking delete, like delete. And, you know, if the door is open to crack, then, you know, put your foot in it and get in there. <laughs> but this is, this goes back to why the phone is such a powerful tool, because the phone is the easiest, fastest way to get a, a real human being on the phone or, or in a conversation, engage them, bring them in, learn something about them. Maybe you have to call, qualify, call back again. And the, you know, there's an entire, you know, industry out there that is uh, doing everything they possibly can to put a wall between humans having stations in the sales process. And I, and, and I understand why it's their own self-interest to do that. The phone, however, is king and still is. And all of the great companies out there that are crushing it, crushing their numbers, killing everything, growing fast, all of them are phone-centric organizations. Despite all the noise that we hear in the world, the real companies, the real leaders know that you got to have salespeople having conversations. And then, and then what's really interesting these days is to see how many companies who went, you know, all the way inside sales are coming back and starting to put field level salespeople out that go stand in front of customers and have face to face conversations because they're realizing that human connection is the true differentiator in a world where, you know, the barrier to entry has come down from, from most products and companies and the competition is fierce. And the, the, the battle for the attention of buyers, uh, not because there are more salespeople, but because there's just more crap going on in the world, uh, more things coming at them as intense. And if I can sit in front of you and, and, and see you, it's, it, we're, we're just, we're, it's so much easier to do, to do business and so much easier for us to, to connect. You know, I was on a sales call yesterday and it was my second time with this, with this company getting in front of them because they're local. So if I can actually get in front of someone physically, it's like even that much better for me to create the relationship. And even on that second call, and it's a, it's a longer selling cycle for this type of you know training is what I do and some marketing consulting. And they said, gosh, we're really sorry. We, we want the other partners in on this meeting. They're not here today. And, Oh, we're like, we feel like we're, we're wasting your time. I've said, Nope, just I'll come back next week. Like, great, another opportunity, another touch point, another chance to get in front of the next set of people all together at the table. Hell yeah, I'll keep going back. Yeah, absolutely. That's the Katy Perry paradigm. So um, so I'm, I, I was uh, coming back from a trip. I'm in Atlanta, hopping my car, um, heading down I-20. 
Um, I, I'm in at the place not 20 where I think there's five lanes on the highway. I'm in the far left lane going as fast as I can. And I don't know if you've ever been on the road and you've had this like sneak, sneaking like feeling that someone's looking at you. And I get this feeling somebody's looking at me and I look over and there's this guy in this Jaguar and I look at him and he looks at me. When he looks at me, he just does one of these. He's like, just like that. And, uh, and <laughs> Shaking I became his immediate. head and disapproving. Yeah, he was like, oh, he was like, what an idiot. Like he was just like, but I got, I became conscious of what I was doing. I, I had like a few minutes before that, I'd had my knees on the wheel and I had my hands in the air and I, w- and I was singing, I am the eye of the tiger, just like that. So I'm just, like singing as loud as I can. And, and as soon as it happened, I'm like, I hate this song. I hate this song. And I don't like Katy Perry. I'm a Taylor Swift fan. I'm Swifty. So, so I'm like, I don't like, I don't like Katy Perry. And I remember I'd had this, this conversation with my wife. Uh, about um, and I won't tell her that you have a crush on me. So we're gonna keep that. No, a don't, don't, me. don't, had, don't. I had a, business crush. I had a, business I had a, crush. Wife about Katy Perry, and you know you're getting old because I'm like, who's writing these lyrics these days? They're just stupid. They don't mean anything, and I, I can't stand Katy Perry. And there I am driving down I twenty, right, singing the song with people looking at me like I've lost my mind. But I'm like doing one of these things, and 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 and, and that's the Katy Perry paradigm. It's the law of familiarity, right? So familiarity breeds liking. So for me, like with that strategy that you're using, that's a series of micro commitments. I'm always looking for every possible way that I can meet with you as many times as I can. So I take a, a, a sales you know, cycle, I break it into as many pieces because the more times I get in front of you, the more likely you're going to do business with me because I'm more familiar. By the way, that starts at prospecting. It's the same thing. But the reason that we, we like, learn to like songs that we initially hate or don't like or don't connect with us is because we hear them so many times, pretty soon there's something in our brain that clicks and says, this sounds familiar, familiar to us. And when you move into someone's familiarity bubble, the probability, the win probability for you in that deal goes up exponentially. And what a lot of people, they don't get that. So they show up, throw up, and, and then they, they move to the next step. Like they're, they're moving on. And, or... You know, in SaaS sales, there's a race to the demo. Let's just get to the demo as fast as we possibly can. So you do this demo and then your deal goes dark. It's stalled. Like the number one problem in tech right now is that there's no decision. And there wasn't no decision. There was a meh. I don't even know who you are. I don't like you. I don't like what you're telling me. You're not doing anything. They didn't make not, not make a decision. They decided that you were a schmuck and they don't like you. So you just didn't realize that and you're not willing to look in the mirror and say that. So what you have to do is start setting yourself up so you create all these touch points so that pretty soon it's like, wow, you know, Gina, man, she just feels like family. We got to do business with you. That's how it feels. And that's the emotional side of sales that everybody's trying to quantify, but you can't. It's just the way human beings work. And human beings, by the way, are incredibly predictable, the way our brains work. So once you understand that, you're able to pull those, those influence levers like familiarity and, and engineer the process from prospecting all the way through your sales cycle. Well, let's segue into that because that is a big thing that you talk about in in objections is the emotionality of the of the selling and the buying. Of course, I I love sales EQ and 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 all of that, but I want to get into this brain stuff because you talk a lot about that. And by the way, yesterday during that presentation, you were in the room with me because micro commitment was in the back of my head because I had just listened to it in the car on my way to that meeting and I'm like, another meeting? Yes. That was the next step, Jeb said. What's the next step? So thank you for that. Uh, so let's let's talk about the emotions and the brain. And then I also want to talk about um sorry, Rachel. I like I saw him first and I'll let I'll share him eventually. I'm not gonna <laughs> fight you for him. I'm just gonna stay out of the way and observe it all. <laughs> so <laughs> let's talk about the emotions and the brain. And I really wanna also dive into be- before we have to let you go, is um, patterns and disrupting patterns. Cause I think that's a really strong one that a lot of people don't talk about. So can you um, elaborate a little more on the emotions and the brain? Well, I think that the, we, well, we have to recognize what I said earlier was that human beings are incredibly, incredibly predictable. And what I mean by that is our brains essentially all work exactly the same. Now, culturally, how we deal with things culturally, that changes. Uh, but the way that we operate as human beings has not changed and it hasn't changed for 40,000 years. So we have a couple of things going on. We have the way that our brains work and we have the way that we communicate. And we won't get into that, but there it's I use an acronym called ACE, but it's it's the the different personality types that you deal with. So if you're dealing with C, CFOs versus CEOs, 
<coughs> their communication style changes, but the way their brain works is exactly the same. By the way, but your brain works is exactly the same. So when we start thinking about dealing with objections, the way that most trainers and most leaders treat the sales professionals' reluctance to face rejection, face objections, is as if it's a psychological disorder. So we tell people, you just got to get over it. You know, don't take it personal. Let it roll off your back. But to the average human being, it doesn't roll off your back. And really, the only people whose back it, you know, rejection is rolling off of are psychopaths. And it's really, really hard to be good in sales if you're a psychopath. So there are people like me who are more outcome driven. So it's easier for me to, to quickly get past you know, the feeling of rejection. But I was explaining to a group of salespeople on Tuesday in Atlanta where I was doing a, a, a training that you know, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've made thousands and thousands and thousands of prospecting calls. And I still feel the same vulnerability. I still feel the same twinge of, I don't want to be rejected every time. What I've learned to do is understand where that comes from and rise above that. So from an obje objection rejection standpoint, what you have to realize is that your sensitivity to rejection is baked into your DNA as a human being because as we have you know, gone through the process of moving out of caves into communities, into a modern world, our sensitivity to rejection has served us really well. It's, it's, been, it's, it's allowed us to pass on our genes when we lived in small groups. And if we got rejected, getting kicked out of the group meant that we would probably get eaten by a saber-toothed tiger and die. And in today's world, we have to work in groups of people. It tells us where the lines are drawn, how to, you know, where, if we push too hard. So it's, it's got good things, you know, for, for you as a human being. On the flip side, in sales, you got a problem because in sales, your job is to go out and find some rejection and bring it home. And, and, you know, in that process, your sensitivity to rejection can be a really, really bad thing. It's a disruptive emotion that keeps you from being persistent, that keeps you from picking up the call and doing it again. That person who shot back at you and defended herself when you were given her coaching, that person was sensitive to rejection and allowed it to become a defensive mechanism that destroyed a relationship. We do things like that. So you have to understand that when you hit the wall of rejection or objection in sales, you don't have the choice to retreat. You can't go backwards. So you have to either get over it, you have to go around it, or you have to dig under it. And the way that you do that is first to become aware of the fact that the way you feel is real. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. It's human to, to feel uncomfortable being vulnerable and putting yourself out there, asking for the next step, asking for the appointment, asking for the deal. Like All of those things are hard. So, if we, But if we just stop there and say, okay, well, if that's hard, what, what, what do I have to do? Well, first, recognize that this is how it is. It's not going to change. There's nothing in the world that I'm going to say that's going to go, hey, you know, you shouldn't be feeling rejected. There, nobody goes, oh, yeah, you're right. I don't feel that way anymore. They, they, they still feel that way. So what you have to do is learn how to rise above the emotion. So in sales, you can choose your actions, what you choose to do. So asking for something, you can choose your response. How do you deal with the fact that someone tells you no? And you can choose your mindset and belief. My mindset and belief is that this is natural. It's natural to feel this way. Uh, but when I respond, I have a choice. I can respond emotionally or I can rise above the emotion and I can choose my response. That's easy to say, hard to do. So you mentioned disrupting patterns, but that begins with getting control of your emotions. So we teach a really simple technique called a ledge. And think about a ledge as like you're holding on to something. You're giving yourself just a moment. Neuroscientists call the ledge the magic quarter second. And that's the magic quarter second that you need to rise above your emotions, typically triggered by the flight or flight response, because when you get rejected, it feels like a threat. And so you respond the way you would, you would to a threat. But it gives you just a moment to, to rise above the emotion and get your neocortex, a smart part of your brain, in executive control. The emotion's still there. The emotion happens without your consent. You don't choose the emotion, you choose your response. So a ledge might be, for example, I was coaching my son who's calling CFOs. The CFO says he's not, I'm not interested. And so his ledge is, that's what every CFO says the first time I call. That's his ledge. He says that every single time. That's what every CFO says the first time I call. And, and because he says that, then he can gather up his thought and he can listen to the tone. He can listen to like the, what he knows about the company, and then he can choose what he's going to say next. And, and this is disrupt. So LDA, ledge disrupt ask. So one of the things that I asked him when we were working through, like when, when they say they're not interested, what would you do? I said, well, what, is, what do CFOs want? 
And he's calling in selling, you know, um, digital transformation of, you know, of managing employees in HR. And he says, well, they want to reduce costs. I said, okay, well, they want to reduce costs. Why? I mean, why would reducing costs matter to a CFO? And he says, well, maybe they want to invest that money in something else to grow the business. I said, that sounds pretty good. So what if, what if you said something like, that's, you know, that's exactly what I figured you'd say, because most CFOs tell me they're not interested the first time we talk. And the reason that those CFOs change their mind later on is because they learn how rapidly we can reduce the cost of running their business so that they can take that money and invest in growth and growth, growth initiatives. And all I want is 20 minutes of your time to see if what we do would be a fit for your business. So he changed that approach from arguing right to that. And I, the way he says it's better, he owned it. And he went from setting four appointments a week to setting 18 appointments a week. Like, so what's the difference? People were telling him no. He just shifted the message and he got control over his emotions. Because before that, they would go, I'm not interested. And he's like fighting because that's the natural response, right? Fight or run. You're going to run away, hang the phone up and move on, or you're going to fight with somebody. And instead, he disrupted the pattern, what they thought he was going to say, get into a fight. And he said something that connected to them. And then he asked again, ledge, disrupt, ask. But the point here is that in that moment, like especially when you're prospecting, it's happening at a million miles an hour. If you don't have a, a methodology or a system or a process of getting control over your emotions, I can tell you that you should do that. I can tell you that there's, there's a better way of handling this. But if you don't have that mechanism in place, you won't be able to get control of your emotions because you're human. And that's what happens to human beings because human beings are incredibly predictable. Which goes back to emotional intelligence and the, and how important it is in sales. Because if you don't understand that, how do you go forward from there? Absolutely. I mean, well, if you don't, if you can't manage your own emotions, how are you going to be, t- be able to influence the emotions and behaviors of other people? So, you know, self-specific emotional intelligence, uh, it's it's a it's a different it's different than emotional intelligence that you need to be a boss or a parent or a teacher because we are working in this sort of artificial commercial bud, uh, bubble that is really highly emotionally charged for both the seller and the buyer. Uh, but for the salesperson, it's all about emotional control because we know a couple of things, and this you know just from from a sales EQ standpoint, we know one thing, and, and that is that in every sales conversation, the human being that exerts the greatest amount of emotional control has the highest probability of getting the outcome that they desire. We know that to be true. So in every conversation, emotional control matters. We also know that the qualified buyer's emotional experience of going through the process with you is a more consistent predictor of outcome of any other variable in the sales and buying process. But if you don't have emotional control, how are you going to deliver a great emotional experience? So it all begins with you controlling your emotions so that you can influence the emotions of other people. And and the reason that I, that, that I believe in frameworks like LDA, Let's Disrupt Ask, is not so much that, you know, I think, you know, everything needs to be a system. It's just that I know how hard it is to control emotions. And I know, and especially with salespeople, because we typically tend to be pretty emotionally driven people. A lot of us are just pure nut jobs. I mean, I, I count myself in the middle of that, right? If we don't have systems that give us the ability in those tense, emotional, conflict-filled moments to manage our emotions, we get into problems. So for example, even your example, Gina, I'm in a meeting and they say, oh, we want everybody else there. One salesperson might go, crap, I got to come back. Or that salesperson would have been, that's okay. Why don't I give you, I don't leave you a bunch of my my brochures. You show it to them. Or the other salesperson says, I'm going to pitch everything. So they just start pitch slapping the buyer right there on the spot, right? They start doing that. You said micro commitment. (laughs) I did. That makes great sense to me. Why don't we do this? How about same time, same bat channel? You get everybody together. They say yes. Now, the next micro commitment might have been, would it be okay in between if I can hop on the phone with these different stakeholders and have a quick interview yeah. so that when yeah. I come back in person, I'm really prepared to answer their questions? Sure. Another micro commitment. So those micro commitments in that moment, right, that gives you the emotional control to advance the sale forward. Yeah. And by the way, you're engineering the emotional experience because they get to see you more often and all of a sudden they think you're Katy Perry. <laughs> Let's take it back to just want to (laughs) emphasize pitch slapping. (laughs) That's a great phrase. (laughs) I love it. Love it. 
And with and and with that group, um, I could have done the let's get let me get on the phone with them, but you know we're in the South. I'm dealing with some Southern men, and I have a much better advantage of like getting in front of them versus getting on the phone with them. So it's also oh, cool. ass- it's also assessing what's going to be the better next commitment. Bingo. But because you have emotional control in that moment, your brain's able to say, okay, there are three paths I could go down. What's the path that's going to give me the highest probability of winning this deal? And because you're aware of what micro commitments are and why they're so important to salespeople for a lot of reasons. For example, one of the benefits of getting micro commitments is something called the investment effect. And we know this because we're human. When humans invest in anything, time, effort, money, right, and emotion, they become more, they, they see the thing they're investing in as more valuable. And when you see something as more value, valuable, the probability that you see it all the way through to an outcome increases. So each time you get a micro commitment and they have to invest, suddenly they become more committed to seeing it to an outcome. The outcome might not be, yes, we want to do business with you, but it's not going to be a stalled deal because they're investing in it. So it's, it, it's a powerful thing. And by the way, every time they meet with you, They have to change their value system just a little bit because they've made a decision to meet with you. And because people are compelled to be consistent with their value systems, each time you meet with them in a micro commitment, you're engineering and moving win probability in your favor because their brains begin to shift and change because you're driving that process. So I love the psychology of selling because all of these things, this is just science. It just works. But it's emotional control that gives you the ability in those tense moments to pull the right levers to get what you want. And to the opposite of that, you talk about um, status quo. And when salespeople show up doing the same thing and there's a similar pattern, people are not likely to buy. But more more so what I found interesting is the people who you know, the the buyers who are not going to switch to a new vendor, even though the vendor has severely hurt them in some way and didn't deliver, and then the buyer stays. You want to talk about that a little bit? Because it's sort of along the the same lines, but to the other extreme. Yeah, so this is, you know, we, we again, we talk about human beings being predictable, and these are some of the reasons why um, people give you objections. So one of them is the negativity bias. And it, all you got to do is go hang out around, around a group of human beings and listen to them talk. They always talk about what's wrong, not what's right. That's, that's the human way of looking at things. Yeah. But, the, but the biggest thing is to understand is that human beings are naturally risk averse. And we're naturally risk averse because it was, it was important to avoid risk in order to pass on your DNA. Right? So we're all here because somebody in our background, like some of our ancestors, didn't do this. Hey, Bubba, hold my beer. Watch this. Like they weren't doing those things because that's how you get taken out of the gene pool, right? So, <laughs> so people, because they're naturally risk averse, they, 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 they become wedded to the status quo. It's a simple heuristic. It's a simple mental shortcut, right? The devil you know is better than the devil that you don't know, right? Don't fix what's not broken. It's, it's why people stay in dysfunctional situations. I mean, you have friends, you've got family members, you've got people that you know who are in totally dysfunctional you know, family situations or totally dysfunctional boss employee situations. And you say, why are you still there? Get out, get out of the relationship, move on. And then you go back six months later and they're still complaining about the same exact thing. Why? Because the status quo feels better than taking a risk. And that risk could be something different, but that different could be worse. Just how salespeople are, are how people work. Add to that the safety bias. And the safety bias is, is that anything that involves risk, I need to slow down on because slowing down and thinking about that risk could potentially save my life. It's just the way people operate. So when salespeople are asking people to make change, which is what we're mostly doing when we're selling, change from the thing that you're doing now to something else, we have to recognize that the safety and status quo biases are always in play and that it's our job to pay attention to that and to and to make sure that along the way that we're in, in a lot of cases bringing it to the surface so we can talk about it. And one of the things that I believe in doing through these micro commitments is getting the objections, the potential objections on the surface early, so before their objections, so we can deal with them. But more than anything, you've got to recognize that you have to build a business case for your buyer that that connects to where they want to go, focusing on business outcomes, metrics that matter and a future state that they can buy into and see, and you have to take them to that place. 
And they need to recognize when they say, you know, I really need to think about that, that in that moment, what's happening inside of them is the safety bias, the status quo bias, these things are, are, are taking over. And you as a salesperson, really what you have to do is you have to come back and you have to remind them of what the future is going to look like. You have to come back and, 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 and essentially minimize their fears, not argue with them, just minimize their fears while you're maximizing, you're showing them where the outcomes are going to be. And, and that's, that happens in discovery. That happens when you're asking questions. That happens through this series of micro commitments. If you're just pitch slapping, if you're just showing up and throwing up, that will never happen because all you're going to end up doing is talking about price. So you have to think about the discovery process and building that case so that when people get to that point, you're almost like a friend putting your arm around their shoulder and saying, look, it's going to be okay, Gina. We're going to do this together. I got your back, but this is going to help you achieve the things that you really want to achieve in your business. And, and, and if you just understand that piece, getting past buying commitment objections, when people tell you, like, I need to think about it, I, you know, it, this, maybe it costs too much or what have you, you, you're able to do that so much more effectively by understanding why they're in that situation. Yeah, that's huge. Rachel, do you want to do you want to ask him any questions, Rachel? Because <laughs> <I, laughs> we're gonna have to wrap up. I know. You can, you no, I just want to. Th- that's definitely amazing because I think a lot of the sales training that I've I've encountered some really great sales training, but a lot of the ways that I have been coached to handle objections is to immediately have something that counteracts. Right. The, uh, yeah, that that in, instead of going. Okay, I understand your objection, and and develop continuing to develop the relationship and giving them the time, and just looking at it as an opportunity to come back and have another touch point. Yeah, and sometimes you know sometimes that's a fallback. You know, a lot of t- times, for example, with a micro commitment objection, all of this is explaining value. Like, what's the value of letting me spend some time with your with your group? But with a buying commitment objection, it's just relating to them as a human being. So if someone says, "Look, I, you know, I just really need to think about this," I go. That makes sense to me. When I'm making big decisions, I like to think it over too because I want to be careful that I'm not making a mistake. I'm just telling them what they're telling me. I just, I'll just say, uh, I'm just curious though. When you, when you need to think it over, what's worrying you the most about my proposal? And then I shut up and they tell me and they say, well, I'm just worried about getting locked into a long-term contract that I can't get out of. And I go, I get that. And then I isolate. I'll just say, other than that issue, um, what else is bothering you? And if they say nothing else, I'll go, okay, well, let's just talk about this for a minute. You know, one of the things that you told me that was really important to you was that you were going to have a vendor, someone to work with that you knew was going to be there with you over the long time, long, long haul. And the past vendors that you had, you know, sometimes they would go out of business, but a lot of times they would get bought up by a bigger company and then you would be out in the cold trying to find another vendor. And the reason that we're putting this agreement in place is, A, to lock in your prices over the long haul so you have peace of mind on that, but B, to make sure that you have the peace of mind that we're going to be there. And the good news is that there's a clause in the agreement that if any time we're not taking care of you and we can't resolve the issue, all you have to do is write us a letter and you're out. So for the sake of your business, why don't we go ahead and get this done? That's minimizing. And then if the person says, listen, it makes total sense to me. I need to, I just really need a day. I'd go, great. How about we get together on Thursday at two o'clock? And in the meantime, would it be okay if I went ahead and scheduled an appointment with your engineers to start the conversation so that when you tell me yes, we won't have to waste any time? Fall back, right? So I'm, I'm still getting a next micro commitment. So it's all about just the wherewithal to step into their shoes, understand, relate to them, not to argue with them. Because first of all, you cannot argue another human being into believing they're wrong. It's not possible. And second of all, it's a person. You're building a relationship with them. And I, I think that you'll go back to EQ, like EQ, being able to, to step in someone's shoes and be empathetic, like that's important. I, I wasn't sympathetic. I'm empathetic. I, I can understand how you feel. My job is still to get you to do the right thing for your business. And, and, and so that's what I have to do. Gosh, I would I would love if we could have you with us forever. But we know that A, you're on vacation. B, you have other podcasts. Uh, your book objections is amazing. So people need to run out and get that. And I, I was listening. Well, I, I listen, I don't read. Uh, you were talking about that. You were in the midst of writing a different book. And then all of a sudden, you were getting all these questions about objections that you quickly moved to writing objections and your publisher loved it. And now you're writing. Sorry, the book you're writing right now. Is that the book you were writing before you started objections? 
Yes, it's called inked, like inking the deal. So it's uh, closing the and sales negotiation. So it's a, it's the follow up book to objections. So it's a objections fit in between. That's awesome. That's awesome. Thank you so much for so much of your time today. We really appreciate it. Um, I, I had more questions, but maybe one day you'll come back as we build our relationship. Just don't tell your wife about it. It's, it's really, really easy. Now you know how to get me on your show because you've got, you've got a direct line into Lisa. So all you got to do is just tell Lisa, hey, we're ready to get back on and she'll get you scheduled in. Oh, that's a micro commitment. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> when um, when uh, are you hoping the ink's going to come out? It'll be out January the 15th, 2020. And then right after that, um, my 12th book will be out um, called Business Outcome Selling Strategies. Wow. Great, so good When's know. the box set going to be available? <laughs> Oh no, we're working on that one. That wouldn't that be awesome? I, we'll get a box set. I, I would like, like. I will. I will sign up for the pre-order for the box set because I have actually I have two copies of Fanatical Prospecting, so I don't need that one. But I figure I'll just give one away. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Well, good. We'll have you back in 2020 because you'll have another book to talk about. So we'll take that micro commitment. We'll stay in touch with Lisa. And best way to uh, for our listeners to connect with you. Where do you want them to go? Which website? Yeah, go to salesgravy.com, go to jebblunt.com. I'm on every social media network, generally at salesgravy, and um, podcast is salesgravy, so I'm on every major podcast channel, and uh, and then we put new videos up on YouTube almost every single day, so we've, uh, there's four or 500 videos up there, um, forward slash salesgravy, and um, I'm everywhere, so come come connect with me, say hello, tell me where you found me, and uh, and, and go buy Objections, you'll, you'll, you'll love this book. for being on our show today and thanks to all of our warners for listening to this episode of women your mother warned you about to learn more about us visit our website women your mother warned you about.com you can also connect with me directly at ginatramarco.com to learn more about pivot 10 results carolina improv or to book me as a speaker or trainer and for rachel you can find me all over social media as rachel on real estate and now you can also find me at rachelmtg.com in my new position shifting over to working in the mortgage industry with us mortgage if you want to get pre-qualified just hop on there rachelmtg.com or just find me on social media or you can find all our social media links easily and a bunch of cool free downloads on our website women your mother warned you about dot com also don't forget on our website you can find the link to itunes where you can leave us a rating and review in case we didn't mention that earlier all you got to do is go to our website click on the subscribe button it takes you right to itunes to our show and then you click on reviews to do that and warners keep on keeping it sexy remember for the best relationships keep it real raw and relevant and a little irreverence doesn't hurt either. Bye, Bye warnings. <laughs> this really will get serious soon. Yeah, I don't, think. it, it yeah. doesn't have to. I don't think anybody wants it to be serious. This has been a presentation of the Seller Die Network. For more podcasts that you can take out into the street and turn into money, visit SellerDieNetwork.com. <laughs>